Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for uh, everyone that's here today. I pray for us today to give you your word, that you would uh, sanctify us in the word, and that you would, uh, that, that we would make much of you today. So Jesus, I pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for worshiping with us. My name is uh, Trevor. I'm the executive pastor here. Did y'all know that? Um, as we talked about all the time, our service is divided up into two sections. Um, the first will be our kids' time, where there's going to be a little bit more interaction. And then we'll have our adult time, where we're going to go verse, through, verse by verse through the text. And uh, in between there, we're going to have a time of confession and all that. Um, I heard someone say one time, I think talking about Mother's Day, but in honor, uh, in honor of Father's Day, the best thing that we can do for dads in the room is go to the next verse. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. So obviously we're going to be looking at the book of Mark. We're almost done with it, right guys? Yeah. We're pretty close. Yeah, Can you guess how many weeks we're on? Are you all counting down? Two, two weeks? One. Counting this week? Yeah. Counting this week, two weeks? Counting this week, three weeks? I think it's three. Three or two, two or three. Two more after this week. Two more after this week. Oh, so I we're close. Right. Three. Yeah, we have three weeks left. That's right. Why are, we, why are we spending so much time on the book of Mark? Because it's the gospel. Because it's the gospel? Ben? Is that what you're going to say? And they have to read all the Mark. Yeah, there's parts that we come to in the book of Mark that are not fun to talk about. And maybe we'll even get to those. We get to text sometimes at, like, this is not a good time to talk about this. Like, it's never a good time to talk about money. Am I right? Nobody likes talking about that. Yeah. So who can tell me, as we've gone through the book of Mark, what have we seen so far? As we've looked at the book of Mark, what have we seen looking through the book of Mark? What have we seen, Grayson? Well, you don't have to tell the whole story, just some, some things that stuck out that you remember. All right. Jesus gets betrayed and some guy ran around naked. Alright, that's true. We did talk about that last week. Jesus was betrayed and some guy ran around naked. What else? Oh, Jesus. Jesus prophesizes. Yeah, he prophesies. He predicts Peter's denial. He predicts Peter, Peter's denial. Yeah. What else? Uh, unfair judges. Unfair judges. Yeah. Unfair judges. Yeah. Yeah. Unfair judges. yeah, we talked about that last week. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Pilot. Pilot is a chicken. Chicken? Yeah. Chicken coward. What about what else? What about like further back than last week? Uh, you remember anything else that's happened in the book of Mark? Oh, sweat blood. Sweat blood. What about the fig tree? There was a fig tree. Yeah, we talked about he cursed the fig tree. We talked about it not bearing fruit in all seasons. Yeah, the, the fig tree not bearing fruit. What else? Yeah, so he told some parables, right? That was one of his parables. With seed landing on soil, different kinds of soil. He cast out demons. Cast out demons. Linda, what, what do you remember from the book of Mark? Do you remember anything from the book of Mark? Not one thing? Do you remember what happened on uh, do you remember what happened with Jesus on the mountain? Do you remember that? You don't remember that? What anybody remember that? What happened? God spoke. And who else was there? Peter. Peter. John. John. James, Jesus' disciples, who else was there? Some, un 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 some people we wouldn't expect. No. You see Moses and Elijah, right? They see Moses, but we don't. They see Moses and Elijah on the mountain, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, transfiguration. Let's just look at a little, little uh, rebrief, debrief. Oh, the Gospel of Mark. Jesus was baptized, and God spoke when he was baptized, right? This is a rundown. This is a rundown. Just for anybody that wants to know, this is what a rundown is. Jesus was baptized and God spoke, right? And the dove descended onto him and says, This is my son, no more, please. Yeah. He was tempted in the wilderness, but did he sin? No, he didn't sin. Yeah, he combated it in the words of the Bible. He, he casted out demons. We see that he healed sick people, he healed blind people, he healed deaf people. He brought back people from the dead. That was crazy, right? He taught some people that, um, uh, oh, he taught parables. Some of them that made people mad. 
Some of them that people didn't understand, right? He had different kinds of parables. He had to explain. He had to take his disciples away and explain some of those parables to them that they didn't understand. Um, he met with Moses and Elijah on the mountain at the Transfiguration. He chased people out of the temple. I think that was popular. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did whip, chased people out of the temple. And he also prophesied a lot about his death and resurrection, didn't he? Does anybody remember from the first week, this is all the way back in week one of Mark, does anybody remember who preached? That was a long time ago. Does anybody remember who preached week one of Mark? Do you remember? Who was it? You got a 33% chance. It was me. That's right. I preached week one of Mark. I knew it because you were smiling. Yeah, yeah, it was me. I thought Grace was going to get it, but I'm clearly not his favorite. <laughs> week one of Mark. All the way back to the beginning of chapter Mark. Does anybody remember why we talked about that Mark was writing these things? Why is Mark writing about all of these things we've talked about this entire book? What do you think? Because Jesus said so. He, well, we know he was right in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's good. That's good theology. Were they letters? Uh, these weren't, th this, wasn't, this, this was a, a, a gospel account according to Mark, probably handed down to him from Peter, who we know was in Rome. I think he wanted to share. Wanted to share? Wanted to tell, tell the whole story of the gospel. That's good. Our verse today, Mark 1 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, our first week in the book of Mark, I said the number one thing that I believe Mark wants to communicate is that Jesus is the Son of God. Some might say the Messiah. That, that, that might be what Mark is trying to say, that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's possible. He does get to that in this book. Some may say the suffering servant. He goes back to the suffering servant a lot. We sing Isaiah 53 a lot because he quotes Isaiah 53 a lot. We'll even read some more quotations from that today. Um, but I see the Son of God because that's where verse 1 ends. That's the declaration that Mark makes at the end of verse 1. I also said that as we look at the whole book of Mark, that we see four occasions where he's actually called the Son of God. I was wrong about that. I messed that up. It was actually seven times. Seven times. Um, we see it when Jesus is baptized. We see it on three different occasions when Jesus is talking to demons. We see it in the Transfiguration. We see it when Jesus is crucified. We're going to talk about that later today. We see this Roman soldier that confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. And we see it in these weird instances where Jesus kind of hints at it. He hints at being the Son of God. Or he may say, uh, Son of the Blessed is a, is, a, is a thing that they'll say. Or he may just say Son. He doesn't actually say Son of what, but he just says Son. Or someone will ask if he is the Son of God. So we see kind of instances like that. Um, the most shocking thing for Mark's audience, though, because Mark had a specific audience, the most shocking thing for his audience would have been the Roman soldier, who we're going to talk about today, confessing that he was the Son of God. Any reasons why? Why do y'all think that might be shocking to his audience? How do you? That's a good question. What do you think? Why would it be shocking for, for Mark's audience? That the Roman soldier be the one to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Because he also lived Well, we don't know that. We actually don't know who the Roman soldier was. We don't have a name. Oh, we don't know how much of the how much he was there for. He might have spent the crucifixion side. I don't know. Was he one of the ones Maybe it's possible. No idea. Any guesses? How, how would he know that? How would he know that? That's a good question. Maybe we'll talk about it. He's Roman, that's good. Um, yeah, so John, John Mark's audience was a Roman audience. So it's going to be a big deal. Does anyone know what the Romans worshipped? They worshipped Rome. Oh, yeah. They worshipped Rome. They worshipped the Caesars. Um, they were to declare that Caesar was God. It, it was nobody else. They worshipped Caesar. Um, and this, this Roman soldier declaring that, that Jesus is the Son of God. They, they saw the Caesars, because there were multiple Caesars. They had multiple gods. So they saw the Caesars as these, these diet versions of gods. But Jesus was, he confessed, the Son of God. Um, so this would have been incredibly shocking to Mark's audience. Um, and, and to not worship the Caesars as God 
would actually could have cost them their lives. At the trial of Pilate last week, we looked at the trial where the Jewish people, they actually, they were God's people, right? The Jewish people, these are God's people. And they declared that they have no king but Caesar. God's people, who are supposed to be worshiping Jesus, who are supposed to be worshiping God, they declared they have no king but Caesar. And they chose to worship the state as God rather than Christ. At this Roman soldier that we're going to talk about later, we see a great reversal. We see a huge reversal. We see a Roman Gentile sinner confess that Jesus is the Son of God. It's at, this cross, it's at the cross where we see the perfectly obedient Son that was obedient to the point of death give His life as a ransom for many. It's at the cross where we see the Son of God pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. It's at the cross where we see Jesus taking all of the wrath of Almighty God in our place and mending the relationship between God and man. It's because of the cross that we can come to God, confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's remember that today as we go into our time of confession. Let's remember the cross. We're going to be looking at, at the cross a lot this week, or th today. We're going to be looking at the crucifixion. We're going to be looking at what Jesus did on the cross we're going to be looking at his confession from this Roman Gentile soldier. So let's go to our time of confession today. If you will stand, I'm going to read the parts that aren't in parentheses. Y'all are going to read the parts that are. Lord God, we confess to you and to one another. We have sinned against you by what we have done. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had the mind of Christ. We have, give, we have grieved you by wasting your gifts and by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, and free us from our sins. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Continue standing as we go to God and worship. We have a will in our seats. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. We're jumping a lot here. Chapter 1 to chapter 15. Let's give a lot of things. Mark chapter 15 at the cross. Today we're going to be looking at the crucifixion. We're going to be looking at the moment in history when God poured all of his wrath on one man to atone for the sins of his people. It's a sad day, but it's a beautiful one. It's because of this day in history that God looks at us and calls us his children. There's a lot that happens here as we look at Mark chapter 15, and you know, we looked at all the other accounts that are there. Um, but Mark, he just kind of gives this little rundown, as almost as he's kind of like glancing across what's happening at the scene. And... Uh, just kind of runs through the details. So there's not a whole lot of details. He even cuts out some of the things that Jesus says on the cross. Um, but he gives us some interesting points that I think we should look at. Um, so that's what we're going to slow down for today. There may be things that we miss um, that we know from the crucifixion story and, and the different accounts of the Gospels. But I think there are some interesting things to look at. So let's start. Um, let's look at verse 21 to 26. Mark 15, 21. They pressed in to service a passer, a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. When they brought him to the, to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull, they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. So first thing I want to look at here is this guy, Simon. Simon of Cyrene. Um, it, it gives an interesting thing. We, me and Mike and Jane were talking about it earlier. Um, when we're talking with Simon of Cyrene, and it says, the father of Alexander and Rufus. 
Um, I thought that was interesting. We, we hear a lot of, or I don't know about a lot, we, we know very little about Simon. But he's always talked about any time there's a crucifixion account. Um, any time we look at Easter stories or anything like that, we look at Simon. But this one actually says, the father of Rufus and Alexander. So I thought, well, who is Rufus and Alexander? Who are these people? Um, these are kind of the first times we actually see their names mentioned in all the scripture. Um, and I think Mark is the only one that actually tells us their names. Um, but Ruf, Rufus was actually a name mentioned in Romans. Romans. Rufus was mentioned in Romans chapter 16, uh, verse 13. This is Paul says, Greet Rufus, chose me the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. The scholars believe that Rufus in Romans 16 is actually the Rufus that John Mark mentions here. Uh, considering the fact that he's writing to a Roman audience and this is going to come to the church in Rome, um, they're going to be talking about these people that are sons of Simon of Cyrene. They're going to be a part of the church in Rome. Um, so it seems that, that, that Simon actually played a bigger part, a bigger role than just carrying the cross. His family actually came to know and love the Lord. His family actually come to be a part of the church. Um, and not just that, but they were also a blessing to Paul in his ministry here. And then as, as they're carrying the cross, they come to this place called Golgotha. That sounds like a fun place to take the kids on weekend. Um, but just as you read it, it's translated place of the skull. Um, he gives this glancing scenery of what he sees as he's looking across. In this place of the skull, it paints a, a nasty picture. And I think it should. It should paint this picture of disgust at this place of, yeah, we don't want to be there. This is not the kind of place that you want to be or that you want to take your family or that you want to end up in. And as they're crucifying, they're dividing up his clothes and gambling. This is telling us that Jesus was likely naked. And they, they're mocking him, calling him the king of the Jews. They've got it written above his head. If you remember from the trial last week, this is something that came up. Golgotha is actually a disputed location, but no matter the location, no matter what it was, it certainly was not a spot you wanted to find yourself. On this day, more than any, people died in crucifixions often of exposure, they died of exhaustion, um, or they died of suffocation. We know from last week as we talked that Jesus was already beaten. He was, he was whipped, he was, uh, he was spit on, he was, he was treated poorly, and he had to endure a death that would have taken hours. We actually see, I mean, as, as it breaks it down, they're arriving, and this is in the third hour, and then in a minute we're going to read the sixth hour, and then in the ninth hour. So this was going to take, this was an hour, hours long process. And all the while, his friends had abandoned him, his family had abandoned him. There were very few people there, a mix of a handful of people. And the rest of the people around were just mocking him. Let's look at verse 27. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You are going, you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it three days? Save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, also along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Our King of Israel now, come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. He was crucified among the transgressors, it says. This is actually a, a citation from Isaiah 53, 12. Isaiah 53, 12, it says, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. See, that's not even something we read in Mark's account, that he's, he's actually praying for the people who are crucifying him, but it's even that is a, is a fulfillment of prophecy. Not only was he, was he crucified amongst the transgressors, not only was he, he labeled with one of them, 
but he's, he's praying for them. He's making intercession for them. He's asking God that he, they wouldn't hold their sins against them. He, and they continued to mock. And they began to mock him for something he had said earlier in Mark 14. That he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. In Mark 14, he tells us that's what he's going to do. And they're, they're just mocking him. They're throwing his words back at him. They're saying, that's what you said you were going to do. Hop off the cross and do it. Destroy the temple. But we know that's not what Jesus is talking about, right? Jesus was going to die. He's going to be buried. And he was going to raise again three days later. And then they're saying this, this phrase, come off the cross that we may see and believe. Come off the cross that we may see and believe. But that's not true. They wouldn't. First, they don't want him to come off the cross. Jesus told, Jesus told Peter, what was it, two weeks ago, that if, if, he were, if, he, if he wanted, he could send a whole legion of angels. And they would fight for him. But that's not what happens, is it? He dies on the cross. That's, that's not what they wanted. They wouldn't want war with the angels. They would certainly lose. But they also wouldn't believe. Jesus coming off the cross wouldn't cause them to believe. They would only harden their hearts more. They would fear. And then the ninth hour comes. Verse 33. I guess the sixth hour. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Some ran and filled, someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. So they think, even in this moment, that that's what Jesus is doing. That, that they're mocking him, saying, Come off the cross. And they think he's calling for Elijah take him off the cross. But that's, that's not what Jesus is doing here. He's calling out to his God. He's calling out to God. He's praying to God. It said as the, as, as the reformers were taken to, to be burned that, they, that repeatedly they would pray and read aloud Psalm 51. However, Jesus, unlike the reformers, the reformers knew they were sinners. They knew they had sinned against God. And this is why they go to Psalm 51 so often. Um, this is what they wanted to be reading as they as they died. But Jesus, he wasn't a sinner. Jesus was the Messiah. So I think it's only fitting that at his death, he's quoting the 22nd Psalm. He's quoting Psalm 22. A few weeks ago, we actually talked about this with the adults whenever he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know we don't want it to be, why have you abandoned? Because we know that's not possible. It's not possible for the Father to abandon the Son. That's a problem with the Trinity. They have better Trinitarian theology than that. So we know that's not possible. And I know that I, I, I do believe that it's talking about God, God's wrath being poured out on Jesus. This turning of his turning of his face on him is, is his wrath being poured out. But what if there's even an even more simplified explanation? What if like performers? Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 for us to see more of what he's trying to say. More of what he's saying in his death. Maybe, maybe the people of that time were supposed to go back to Psalm 22 and they were supposed to, to hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And even see in Psalm 22 that what's happening on the cross right now is prophecy being fulfilled. Um, we're going to read Psalm 22. Um, and just pick up on things that you see as, you, uh, as you're going through this, the different prophecies that are being fulfilled here. Uh, but Psalm 22, verse 1, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry day by day, but you do not answer. And by night that I have no rest, yet you are holy. Oh, you who are enthroned, Enthroned upon the praise of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. If you, if, if, if you they trust and were not disappointed, but I am 
I'm a worm and not a man. I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are, of my joint, uh, are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, they look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, O you help, O you my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will, be, will, will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and declare his righteousness. To a people who will be born that he has performed it. I don't know if that's what Jesus was wanting whenever he quoted Psalm 22 1. But if you can't help but see the see the, the exactly what's happening on the cross is happening here in Psalm 22. They're mocking him, they beat him, he's exhausted, he's tired, he's worn out. He gets, into, he gets into here of, of how, how his mouth is even feeling. He goes into great detail of how, how he's feeling here. And maybe that's just all he can get out. It's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if the people had just heard and remembered, if the people had just heard and known what he was saying, but it was all by God's plan. It was all by God's plan that this would happen. It's all by God's plan that he would be crushed. That he would pay for the atonement of the sins of his people. Even in his prayers, even though he, he heard him, we, we, hear, we see in Psalm 22, that even in his praying out, God hears him. That this was part of his plan. And this is why. We go back to, go back to Mark 15. Go back to Mark 15. We're going to look at verse 37. Mark 15, 37, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We know from other accounts that Jesus says, into your hand I commit my spirit. And even in that one instance, he's still showing that he's God. John 10, 17 says, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Jesus gave his life out of obedience to the Father. And he will, and Jesus will take it up again. 
We'll, we'll, we'll read about that next week. In the next two weeks, we're going to read about that. That Jesus is going to take his life up again. The story's not over here. We have hope because the story's not over here. Jesus, being God, has power over life and death. In this verse, we learn that not only is Jesus God, not only does he have power over life and death, but he is mediator. He is the mediator. We see that the veil, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Um, this veil would have been the veil leading to the Holy of Holies. And it could have only been ripped this way by God. It could only be ripped at all by God. That, the, the veil was insanely huge. But it was ripped from top to bottom. And it was to show that this sacrificial system was over. The sacrificial system was no more. In the fall, the start of the school year, we're going to start looking at the book of Hebrews. And we learn that all throughout the book of Hebrews, the sacrificial system is over. It's ended. We no longer have to depend on temporary atonements that we have to do each year, each week, each month. But we, we can look to Christ, the finished work of Christ, who atoned perfectly for his people once for all. And then we get to verse but then we get to verse 39. In verse 39, when the, when the centurion, which is a Roman soldier, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Therefore, that there were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome. When he was in, when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him, and there were many of other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. This is the moment we've been building to. This is the moment we've been getting to, the confession of the Roman soldier that this man was in fact the Son of God. Ben asked, how did he know? How would any of us know that Jesus is the Son of God? We only know that by revelation of the Holy Spirit. We know, we, we, know that, we know that Jesus is God because God reveals that to us. And he does so before all of these witnesses, a handful of ladies. We know, we know uh, from other accounts that John was there. Maybe there were some older boys with, with, these, with these women. But we, we see this, this Roman confession, and we're reminded that Mark wants the Romans to know that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what Mark wants. That's what Mark wants the Roman Church to know. That's what Mark wants all the Romans to know. That Jesus is the Son of God. And not only is he the Son of God, but he's the Son of God who mended the relationship between God and man. The Romans, they had all of these gods. They had tons of gods. But none of them would ever give their own lives to mend the relationship between God and man. They were wicked gods. They were wicked rulers. But not Christ, not Yahweh. He sent his only son to, to mend the relationship between God and man. And then he also, he wants them to believe the gospel. He doesn't just want them to know that he's the son of God, but he also wants them to believe the gospel. We don't know whatever happened to this Roman soldier here. He might have just been like the demons. The demons all throughout the book of Mark confessed that Jesus was the son of God, but they never did anything with him. But we also know the story's not over here. Jesus comes back. Three days later, he rises from the dead. And he sends his people on a mission. I think as we're looking at this book today, we didn't know, let us, let, let, let us as the church confess that Jesus is the Son of God, who mended the relationship between God and man. We need to believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, was obedient to the Father to the point of death. That he, he gave us the right to be called children of God. And he sent us on a mission, as Psalm 22 says, to declare his righteousness to all generations. That's what we're told to do. Let's pray. Then Father, thank you for this time. I pray for, uh, I pray for us this week that you would uh, 
you would help us to remember the mission, remember your calling. I pray that you would uh, use us to glorify you where we're at, our jobs, um, our friends um, in this town. I pray that you would use your church. I pray that you would grow your church. That you would send lost people to come near you. So Jesus, I pray. Amen. Just stand before God and worship. <laughs>